I want to welcome you this morning to Emmanuel Cathedral here in Shelby, North Carolina. Today we're going to be studying from the book of Mark, beginning with chapter 1, 1 through 8. We'll read that in just a moment. But if you missed last Sunday's service, I made the comment, which is still so very true. The first advent, which if you remember, the term advent means a coming or a revealing. And so the first advent that we celebrate was the coming of Jesus the first time to the earth. But when he came the first time, that advent really doesn't have a lot of meaning unless there's a second advent. And he promised and he said in his word that he would be returning. And it's interesting that the readings that we have for today, the first one I'm going to be reading talks about his first coming. But then I'm going to read a few things that set up about his first coming. But then we're going to read a little bit about his second coming. Because as I said, his first coming doesn't really hold as much importance to us if there's not a second coming. His second coming is more important because the first coming, if he just came to the earth, he lived, he died, but that's all he did, then that's really not a whole lot of good for us. But the fact is, he didn't, didn't just come, live, and die. He was resurrected. The word says he rose up from the grave. He res was resurrected. He ascended back into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And one day, he's coming back to take us where he is, that we can live with him forever and ever. So that second coming is what we're focusing on. But because of that, we celebrate not only his first coming, but his second coming as well. So let's read from Mark 1, where this fo primary focus of this reading is his first coming. Let me get a drink of water right quick. Okay, Mark 1, beginning with verse 1. It says this, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that is, is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now turn over with me, first of all, to Malachi chapter 3. And I want to show you, you know, I was watching TV the other day and I heard a comment that was so dumb. A guy said, you have to read the New Testament to find out anything about Jesus because he's not mentioned in the, New, in the Old Testament. That's a total lie. The Old Testament is full of prophetic words about Jesus is full of prophetic words about his coming. It's full of prophetic words about all of these things. And look, we just read here in Mark some things, but look at Malachi chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. We're going to read part of that verse. It says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Isn't that what it said? In verse 2 of Mark 1, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. 
That was a prophetic word spoken in Malachi. Now if we turn over to Isaiah chapter 40 and look at verse 3. Verse 3 of Mark 1 says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Look at Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. What does it say? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So you see, Jesus fulfilled so many of these prophetic words. And here it's talking about John the Baptist preparing the way for the coming of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was not the Christ, and he would say so himself. But he was sent as one to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. He came baptizing. And everybody, a lot of people thought, I'm going to say everybody because apparently not everybody did, but a lot of people thought that he was crazy. What does it say in verse 6? He was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And it says he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, folks, that was not normal at that time. He lived out in the desert, in the wilderness. He came almost out of nowhere, it seemed. But we find, reading later on, that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And we know that when Jesus' mother, Mary, visited John the Baptist's mother while she was still pregnant, the Word of God tells us that when they met, John the Baptist, in his mother's belly, leapt for joy and was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb when he heard the voice of Mary because they knew, he knew that she was carrying the Messiah, the Son of God. So John knew his place and he knew who Jesus was. Now apparently from that time forward there was a separation from John the Baptist, and Jesus. They apparently didn't grow up together. John was apparently separated from Jesus because later on, when they come together, John didn't seem to recognize Jesus, but he had some things that God had said, when you see certain things happen, you'll know this is the one. And all those things came to pass. But John the Baptist's whole purpose was to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. What was he doing? He was baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And it says, All the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him, and all were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So he was preparing people. He was trying to get them ready. Because he says in verse 7, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. And he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, in other places, it says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, you see, he knew his place and he knew who was coming. So, he was trying to get people ready for the coming of Jesus. What should we be doing during this time as we look upon our remembrance of Jesus coming the first time, even here at Christmas. 
What kind of life should we be living? We should be preparing our hearts to receive Jesus and be ready. You know, we spend so much of our time during Christmas, and sometimes I've told people, I get so frustrated during Christmas because of all the hustle and bustle and all the money that's spent and how, you know, if you go to the stores now trying to buy anything, People can be so rude and they've forgotten what the true spirit of Christmas is all about. It's not about giving and getting presents and gifts. It's about remembering who our Savior is and the fact that he came to save us from our sins. John reminded us that we needed to repent and get right. Jesus was on his way. People are out being the most aggressive drivers. People will cut you off, off and flip you off right in the middle of traffic and you're thinking they don't have a whole lot of Christmas spirit. Because true Christmas spirit, the word tells us that Christmas spirit should really be love for your neighbors and those around you. That's what really shows that we're Christians. <clears throat> what did Jesus say was a way that people would know that we were his disciples? Not by the presents that we bought each other, and not by how much we accumulated. He said, they'll know that you're my disciples by how you love one another, by the love you show for one another. That's how it works. And unfortunately, it seems at this time of year when we should be showing one another love, that's one of the last things you see. People are aggressive. People seem to act like they can't stand one another. And unfortunately, it can be a very hard time for many people because, you know, people who have lost loved ones, this is a very painful time of year. That's when we should really be thoughtful about the ones around us. Even the ones who treat us badly, we need to have compassion for them because we don't know what they're being, they've been through or what they're going through. It's difficult. Somewhere around this time of year in 2022, around Christmas and right after Christmas, the end of 21, the beginning of 22, we lost four people very close to us in our family or very close to our family. It was one of the hardest times that we've had to endure. And I could understand why people would have a hard time celebrating Christmas with all that going on. And it was difficult for us. And I know that other people may have things like that going on in their lives. So just because they're not nice to you doesn't mean we shouldn't be nice to them because we don't know what they're having to deal with. So we as Christians should be the ones to show love. In this season of Advent, the last two Sundays being the first two Sundays of Advent, we've lit the first two candles of the Advent wreath. One of them represented love, but today's candle was peace. We know that Jesus, one of his names, one of the things he's called is the Prince of Peace. That's one thing we all long for, is peace. Especially in the world that we live in right now, there's not a lot of peace. 
There's wars and rumors of wars all over the place. And on top of that, there's so much conflict between people in our own country. Our country, in the time that I've been here on this planet, I've never seen such division in our country in my life. There's not a lot of peace even in our own nation. We need peace. And the only way for true peace is through the Prince of Peace, and that's Jesus. Now, I told you that we were going to read something that talked about the second coming of Jesus, and that's in 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to read 10 through 13. And it says this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we know that there's coming a judgment upon the earth. And Peter is telling us here, because we know that all these things are going to happen and everything around us is going to be dissolved, how should we be living? What manner of persons should we be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because everything's going to change. My little five-year-old grandson, I know he doesn't quite understand it, but oftentimes he'll say, I sure wish Jesus would come. Now he knows that when Jesus comes because he's heard us talk about it, everything's going to change. I don't know about you, but the way things are right now, I have those feelings too. Sometimes I really wish Jesus would come because this place is not getting any better and the only one who can straighten it out is Jesus. But you know, some of us may have some things we need to clean up or get right before he comes. Probably all of us do. All of us have some things that we could be better at and need to improve in our lives. And I know sometimes these are not topics that we want to discuss or want to talk about or are not popular. But let's be real. When you see the things happening like they are in the Middle East, when you see the things happening all around us, does it not appear to you that the time is drawing short and that Jesus could be coming back soon? In light of all of that, shouldn't we be doing everything we can to get our lives right and to get ourselves straightened out with him? We need to do what we need to do to make sure that our lives are in order and that we're in right standing with him. Anything that would cause us to be separated from him needs to be resolved. Anything we can do to get ourselves closer to him needs to be resolved. Our world shows us that time's getting shorter. My older grandson said, yeah, but Papa, people have been saying that for 2,000 years. 
But you know what? There are prophetic things that have taken place recently, prophetic things that have been fulfilled that have never been fulfilled before. And because of that, we're very sure, we should be very sure, that the time's getting short. And I just want to close with this. We need to get our act together and come in line with the Prince of Peace. He's the only one that can bring us peace. He's the only one that can save us from the things that are coming upon the earth. He's the only one that can help us get through the things that are coming upon the earth. I pray today that if you've not gotten everything straightened out, that you'll take this as a time to reflect upon your relationship with Jesus. And that you will decide today that I want to do whatever I need to to examine my life and do what I can to make sure I'm ready that if today were the day, I'd be ready to meet him. Because he's coming soon. And I'm not one of these guys who tries to give you a date, a time, because he says no one, not even the son, knows the time and the date. Only the Father. But I just know from what I've seen, from what I believe, and from what I've, I've seen with all the things going on around us, that the times are growing short. My biggest desire is that everyone who hears this be ready. He loves you. He really does. And he wants you to spend eternity with him. A time of peace, love, tranquility. He truly loves you. That's why he came and gave himself for you and now sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. Well, I'm going to close now. I just want to say Jesus loves you and we love you. And we'd love to see you here at Emmanuel Cathedral. We're going to be gone for a couple of weeks with different things going on. I would ask maybe next week, which is December the 17th, we're going to be joining with Lafayette Street Church for their cantata. If you're here not close by, don't have a church home, perhaps, and would like to visit, come and join them at 1030 for their cantata. The following week, we will be gone to Texas to visit our parents, visit my parents, my family. And then we'll start back up December 31st. And we'd love to have you come and be here with us. Until then, on January, on, excuse me, on December the 24th, Lafayette Street Church is having a candlelight service at 5 p.m. I know that they would love to have you come and join them. So, until then, may God bless you. May you be blessed during this time of Christmas. And just remember the true meaning of Christmas. The first advent of Jesus. The fact that he came, not because he had to, but because he desired to to save us from our sins, to help restore us to the Father, we pray for you that you'll get back in line. If you have, if you're not already, get back in line. Let Jesus help you 
during this wonderful time of the year. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you.